I love GRPGs. My undying love for Japanese animation and unique fantasy plus intriguing storylines goes a long way, with me enjoying several titles within the genre. Typically, a lot of people think of JRPGs as Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest, and granted, they are those styles of games, but there are way more to talk about than just those two. Most games now are getting more and more creative with how they approach making a role-playing game, and to me, the ones that did it right were Atlas alongside the entire team behind the Persona series. Although not entirely interested at first, I grew to have a soft side for the games due to the music and animation for a lot of the cutscenes I saw floating around. I ended up getting a copy of Persona 4 and played it on and off for quite some time until I managed to clear through the game, only to say, alright great, new safe? This mentality kept up until I 100 percented the game a couple years back. I then immediately got a hold of Persona 3 FES and did the same thing. So to put a long story short, I loved these games, and despite the long runtime the Persona series is known for, I still enjoyed my time in both Iwatodai and Inaba. But in 2017, a new adventure unfolded in a city called Tokyo, and I never saw it coming. I remember when the first teaser was brought up and watching it over and over again. I was always trying to theorycraft what the heck this game was and how it would rival my love for Persona 4. The true nature of the fourth game felt so raw and genuinely real despite its bizarre concept. So I was surely hoping Persona 5 would follow suit. I thought about who the main character would be and where it'll take place and if the game would feel the same in comparison to what I was used to. Even with this little no detailed trailer other than just, hey, the game's coming out, I still was so curious and couldn't help but theorycraft. Persona 5 was delayed multiple times, which was interesting since it seemed as if the game would soon be put into development hell, or even cancelled altogether. However, by some string of a miracle, it was released in Japan on September 2016 and in April of 2017. I was a senior in high school when the game dropped and I recall taking <coughs> two sick weeks to binge this game. Oh, did I mention that this game is like 70 plus hours? No? Really? I myself have 100% of the game, which for me warranted three playthroughs since I messed up a lot. However, I still find myself getting the same chills at certain parts, and even when I was skipping some segments, I still felt at home even with the game's replayability being a bit unrewarding beyond a second run through. My anticipation for the game was at an all time high, and I still look back on release day and get excited about seeing that main menu for the very first time. The story takes place after the main character, who I'll just refer to as Joker, gets caught in an incident trying to defend a woman from being abused by a drunken man late into the evening. Joker was put under probation for his actions, and then got expelled from the school he was attending. Which that's pretty rough. In the city, he stays with a local coffee shop owner named Sojiro Sakura, who was a family associate from what the game tells you. Joker has to stay up in the shop's attic, and for how rustic it looks, it slowly becomes a dainty room full of charm. Well, after it's cleaned, of course. He begins attending a new school known as Shujin Academy, thus pushing Joker into being looked at as a wanted criminal for the misunderstood actions from fellow students. However, with the city running rampant with corrupt adults, the whole change of hearts theme is prevalent from the get-go. It made me feel way more immersed into the universe that I was in, and added so much connection from player to game. As the game soon progressed into the early moments, Joker then begins to dream and ends up in what is known as the Velvet Room. This is a velvet-colored room in between dream and reality, with its owner known as Igor describing Joker's situation and how he could overcome it. This time around, the room is now looking like a prison, and Joker is to be a prisoner of the room itself. In other titles, the Velvet Room has been shown as different areas such as a limousine or just an elevator, but overall, they serve the same purpose from game to game. In Persona 5's case, it's to rehabilitate and change the hearts of corrupt humans to revert and make them confess for their actions. Each person who is corrupt enough has what the game calls a palace. This basically describes the corruption that person has visualized and made real within their heart. The design of each of these palaces make the game so interesting and make you also want to explore the depths of what these corrupted worlds are like due to them being so bizarre but real enough to immerse you even further into the gameplay and story. With palaces taking strong inspiration from Persona 4's dungeons, an area called Mementos takes a lot of similar qualities from Persona 3's main dungeon, Tartarus. 
Mementos is a sprawling underground subway system that contains the corruption of the general public, due to the corrupted ideals not being enough to warrant an entire palace. Each area is similar in aesthetic, which is closely resembling what Tartarus was in Persona 3, as mentioned earlier. Having both creative dungeons and a floor-based dungeon in this game really let the player do more with their free time and enjoy more things within the city. Another aspect of the story I loved is the characters and how they were gradually introduced, especially in the intro. Each member feel as if the world is against them and they see some of the scum of their society walk around freely without any consequence for their actions. Out of the bunch, I loved the way On was tied in and brought into the main group, as well as Makoto was later in the story. Each member feels like they were meant to serve a bigger purpose in this game's world, and the story develops on that element very nicely throughout the game, and it allows for some very genuine interactions and entertaining moments. Granted, the bickering between Ryuji and Morgana gets a bit out of hand in the later half of the game, but it doesn't become too overbearing in my honest opinion. It's just more of a small gripe with how they interact, that's all. The way each character in the game interact with one another really adds layers onto this already massive story. I mean look, even the members hang out casually in between waiting for the next palace and grow closer as a group. Once in a while, you'll even get a call or a message from a member asking if they want to hang out or just talk to ease their mind. This honestly helps build upon each character as a whole once you delve more into confidants, but we'll touch up more on that later, don't worry. Now, Persona 5's story may be good in my opinion, but it has some shortcomings despite me enjoying it quite a lot. Some writing in the game's story felt a bit lackluster with how the characters were treated and such, but it honestly didn't hinder the overall plot, this is just more of a nitpick. Another thing would be the character interactions feeling a little less genuine compared to previous games like 3 and 4. I still loved each member of the Phantom Thieves and even other characters outside of that group, but just in comparison to 3 and 4, it just isn't up to that level, which honestly, I'm fine with. That does not mean the game is awful, and honestly, it's easily still my favorite in the series, bar none. In terms of gameplay, this game follows a turn-based battle system like that of Final Fantasy or many other turn-based combat games. However, it deviates a little bit with its approach on how you utilize moves with certain personas. Each enemy you meet in the game has a chance to become a member of Joker's roster, due to him being known as the Trickster in the game. Unlike his party members, he can control multiple personas at the same time, which begins to make your combat much more involved. Certain shadows have set weaknesses and or strengths for different situations, and due to this, the battles can go on in a multitude of ways based on your team comp. Each main boss in this game also has an interesting moveset and keeps you engaged throughout the entirety of the fight. Not to mention that certain bosses' moves are based on the palace you were exploring, which makes things feel more grounded yet dynamic. Each fight on challenge runs or even on merciless mode can actually be deadly if not prepared, and believe me, I have died a lot on my merciless playthrough. Some bosses have an obvious weak point, while others are full mind games and force you into the fight a bit longer until you manage to find the best strategy to take them out. It can be a bit hard, especially for me when I went against the game's second boss, Madarame. His boss isn't exactly hard, more or less just very annoying, but once you fight him on a harder difficulty, you'll get what I mean. Despite that one fight being the outlier, I enjoyed almost every boss the game threw at me, and I even love the secret bosses the game gives you the option to fight at the end of the game. Each palace has a variety of activities to go on before the mini bosses and bosses themselves, which also add a lot of creativity and style to navigating the areas themselves. 
I actually enjoy a lot of the puzzles and figuring the proper layout of a palace just to get through it in the most efficient way possible. The mini bosses usually are just shadows the player has already seen, just buffed and given a new move or two. These can be a pain if you don't know the attacks, but usually most mini bosses aren't too bad and honestly, were really fun to fight. There is another returning aspect in Persona, known as Fusion, and to give you the shortened version, you take one Persona, you take another Persona, you fuse them together, boom. New Persona. Now, this may not seem like much, but some of them are only made exclusively this way, and trust me, a lot of these Personas are very, very useful. The Fusion Forecast feature does not make a return, however, but honestly, the base Fusion options given in this installment are still enough to be actively creative with creating a decent team or a good team in this game. I honestly found myself enjoying Persona 5's combat way more than most turn-based RPGs, which to me is quite surprising. I can't quite put into words how enjoyable the combat is in this game, and this is coming from someone who has always been very 50-50 with turn-based RPGs. But Persona 5 was different. Between its style and its charm and how the combat system actually worked out, I enjoyed it way more than I thought I would, and as a whole, it made the game fun to look at and fun to play. I don't really get that with most games, and especially turn-based RPGs, excluding the recently released Dragon Quest XI, and a few others that I can't really think of off the top of my head. Overall, it good. When you aren't stealing the hearts of corrupted adults after school in the most stylish way possible, you're just a regular student who's trying to find his place in his newfound surroundings. This is made difficult with the excessive negativity surrounding Joker's name due to his previously mentioned expulsion. The students, some teachers, and even Sojiro, Joker's caretaker, is against him for most of the early sections of his stay. On a later note, however, the story turns Sojiro into a character who genuinely feels like a father figure of sorts, and really helps Joker out with keeping a roof over his head and giving him some responsibilities to do within LeBlanc. The students sadly don't change much, but some friends you make such as Ryuji and On become members of the Phantom Thieves, which is a group that is led by Joker. You also befriend a few other characters that also join the group, known as Makoto, Haru, Futaba, and Yusuke. Each area in Tokyo feels alive, and as if there's always something to do to either raise a social stat, or just to kill time by sightseeing. It's interesting witnessing some of these events, and it really keeps the city alive all throughout the game's long runtime. Granted, I do feel like certain areas were just a little barren or meant to only garner one activity compared to the others. Now, this could all change in the recently unveiled Persona 5 R, that is assuming it is a Persona 4 Golden and Persona 3 FES approach, in which more content was added into the game such as new areas and even characters to talk to. Honestly, in contrast to the nitpick I just made, I still love each place the game has you explore, and it made me really enjoy several activities I never thought I would have liked otherwise, like fishing, reading, and working a part-time job? Alright, look, I know it sounds boring, but like many other life simulation games like Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley, the game makes these activities pretty engaging. This is due to the social stat bonuses you get from certain things you do within the city. I also love the fact that exploring several areas benefits you, and it feels as if the game is rewarding you for taking your time and looking for new things to do in between dungeons. Truth be told, most of my Persona 5 playthrough was just looking around and sightseeing all the beautiful areas in the game, and just trying to discover new activities in the process. It all feels so natural, and nothing feels shoehorned in at the last second in terms of areas introduced. Everything feels great in that regard, and it made visiting these places more memorable for me. It isn't some hyper-realistic Red Dead Redemption 2 type of discovery for sure, but the way it's handled for this game's style is a thing of beauty. A lot of JRPGs try to convey a real connection between the characters and the player throughout the entirety of the game. Games such as Kingdom Hearts really shed some light of each character growing in a very genuine fashion. This allows the player to feel a connection, and therefore, get more immersed into the world as a whole. This leads me to the mechanic most commonly found and almost exclusively in Persona games, 
known as social links, or in Persona 5's case, confidants. Ever since Persona 3 released in the US around 2007, social links were introduced and were a huge feature that gave the game something new to show off. Each social link represents a single arcana, and raising one increases things like XP, the personas themselves, and your relationship with that character. This overall made the world feel way more real and alive, which genuinely got me attached to certain cast members despite not liking them initially. This mechanic alone adds a new layer of depth onto the already massive story being told, and even solidifies how important your schedule is in the game. Each activity you do takes time out of your day, and as such, you are limited to doing around 2-3 activities per day. This in turn with the social links makes for interesting choices with your schedule and benefits both gameplay and the story. Seeing different characters change as the story progressed made me feel way more attached to the city and care more about each individual confidant. Just being able to witness a side chapter in this already massive game felt blissful, and having some free time each day allowed me to think about which confidant I'd want to hang out with and see grow as a character. Plus, some characters required you to meet certain social skill requirements to fully explore their story. This gave purpose to many of the activities you were able to do throughout the city, which I also enjoyed quite a lot. Each confidant you progress through will give you extra skills that change the gameplay in a few ways. For example, the doctor named Takemi will have you partake in clinical trials to test medicine. Not only does this increase your guts, but after a while, you'll start to see her story unfold, and as a reward for maxing your rank out with her, you get more medical items to purchase, and even discounts on the items that she sells. Now it isn't just max out the confidant and get cool ability, no. You still get rewarded with small but useful abilities along the way. Some can be an increase in XP, or others can be adding more items to a shop that can aid you in palaces. Either way, there's always a reason to talk to these confidants and not only see a cool story, but benefit your team as well. Now, visiting every one of the 16 confidants takes a lot of time out of your schedule, so finding time in between palaces and deciding to eat a burger the size of your head is difficult to say the least. It isn't impossible though, as you can max every one of these characters in a single run of the game, if done correctly. But, let's go ahead and talk about something a bit more important. Waifus. We all know Persona 5 as characters you can talk to and hang out with, but you can also choose to date certain female characters. However, this isn't anything new since previous games like 3 and 4 added this feature in prior to 5. But, for a lot of people, this was their first Persona game, so it was very fresh and new I'd imagine. Now, dating doesn't add too much other than a few cutscenes after the final dungeon, a few rare items, and the fact you can finally say you're dating someone. Sort of. Now, you can go full harm if you'd like, but let me show you this clip here and, um, yeah, you'll see what happens. Now for me, music in video games matters more than ever. Every game I play, I try my hardest to pay attention to the soundtrack since the songs themselves tell stories about the game without any words most times. Persona has always delivered on that front, with each song fitting the tone of the games that they were put in. Persona 5, however, exceeds every bit of expectation I had for the soundtrack in the first place. The moment I heard the intro song play alongside the wonderfully animated opening, I was floored. Everything in this game's score fits perfectly and it's just as stylish as the game's overall visuals. There isn't a dull moment in the game's OST and it always feels great to listen to even outside of playing the game. Now here are a few snippets from a few songs that I really enjoy in the game soundtrack.
as you can tell, these songs alone fit the game's overall style and as a whole make the world feel much more interesting and fills in the space the game leaves open for music. I just love walking around and listening to Behind the Mask in the game while it rains, and it honestly gives out this weird noir type of vibe with it. It all matches beautifully, and that's just with one song. There are several others that give off different feelings for different moments of the game. Some songs are just super tense due to the plot, or even small jingles that play when you purchase an item at a shop. Battle themes between normal enemies and bosses also feel very grand and epic, and all have great structures that fit well with the fights themselves. The creators of the soundtrack, including Shoji Meguro, outdid themselves, and I just adore all the work they put into this OST, since it's the highest of quality it could have possibly been in my opinion. In comparison to the other games, it's right on par with both 3 and 4. I also watched videos of the Persona Live shows and hearing the 5 soundtrack played by a band is just amazing to say the least. I even played the rhythm games for Persona 3, 4, and now 5, and still to this day played Persona 5 Dancing and Star Knight just to hear both the original songs and the amazing remixes. It goes without saying that this game has a stellar soundtrack, but seeing the music in the game getting love from both live performances to rhythm games shows that this aspect of the game is not just meant to be in the background. It's really something else, man. It's really special. I'm no artist or anything, but my god, Persona 5 is a beautiful game in terms of its visuals. The reason most people found this game appealing is simply based on this factor alone. I've met people through streaming my platinum run of the game who were interested in this game based on its overall graphics and aesthetic. Each little menu in this game is stellar to look at, and not only is it stylized, it doesn't get clunky in the slightest. Everything is easy to navigate through and through, and as someone who pays attention to UIs and menus occasionally, seeing Persona 5s fills me with joy. I never struggled with finding out which menu led to which, and seeing the shop menu transitions were also very amazing. Things were distinguished nicely and, again, didn't feel out of place. The palette that was used as well for each submenu and menu didn't look too jarring whatsoever no matter how many times I looked. Everything is placed neatly and in a similar style to Persona 3 and 4 with how that layout worked. The designs of the character models are such an upgrade from the PlayStation 2 era models that most fans remember, and just seeing the evolution with how nicely rendered the models are now is just interesting in of itself. Not to mention the design of each area, big or small, feels much more alive in this stylish animated world. As I mentioned earlier, exploring the world was a delight. The palaces and mementos are also well designed, and each area feels fitting for either a certain character or a certain story segment. For example, let's take a look at Kamashita's palace. This man is a volleyball coach who views the whole school as his castle. That being said, his palace is a castle. This correlation that you can occasionally see when going into safe rooms, where the real world school can be seen, is such a creative way of showing the player what the palace was based on. Now, not all palaces do things the same, but they are all still very creative regardless of how you spin it. Some real world areas in Japan also make an appearance, like Akihabara and Shibuya. There are several images showing off a comparison of how each place looks in the real world versus in-game, and seeing these places in the P5 art style is amazing. The palaces, as mentioned earlier, are also equally creative and really show off the game's wild side in terms of the out-of-this-world ideas. I am aware that this game was made in 2017 rather than the others being made way before that, but for the first proper game in the HD era, it went all out, and it shows. Persona 5 has been the greatest time I've had with any JRPG or game in general. I have some of the fondest memories diving into the wonderful story and meeting all the great characters the game had to show me. I truly felt as if the year that Joker spent away was time I spent away in his place. I felt that I was there and I honestly cared a lot for each character that was a part of my team, and even outside of my team. I loved the designs of the world, the music that accompanied the world, and pretty much everything else. Not to mention the combat system in the way it plays is the most engaging and stylish turn-based system I have seen in a long time. My attachment to the series is irreplaceable and I'm so happy that we could potentially get more of the Persona 5 universe over the next coming months and years. I refrain from spoiling this game too much for those who have yet to play it, but if you are interested in playing the game or giving it a shot, please do. Every moment I played this game, I was in awe of something, and it gave me a sense of wonder and joy when exploring. The music and designs for the game were some of my favorites that I have seen and heard, and stand out amongst other titles I have played. Just do yourself a favor and play Persona 5. 
I'm aware it isn't everyone's cup of tea, but there's a reason people are mind blown over Joker being in Smash. Even people were freaking out over the fact that Persona 5 was going to be getting another game under the name Persona 5 R. The ending of the game made me want more and truly established the fact that Persona 5 is beyond just a video game for me. It's more than that. And I'm honestly grateful that I even had the chance to live in an era where I was able to soak it all in and play the game for what it was. Thank you to everybody that developed the game. Thank you to Atlas, P Studio, and every developer. You all did a wonderful job with this game, and I'm excited to see what Persona 5 R is, and I'm excited to see what's in store for all of us fans of Persona 5. So, with that, I'll see you guys around.